Hi, I'm Peter Zeitz. I'm a research fellow at the Xerox Protocol. And this presentation is about um, how our plan for updated token mechanics, so, so as you guys are aware, there, there's this proposal for changing the Xerox token mechanics, um, how that program is going to fit into our overall long-term agenda for governance. Like, so, and the presentation is entitled um, Xerox Governance, Fees, and Liquidity Rebates. And this is something that Amir, Will, Weiji, and I have been working on for a while, and we're really excited to bring to you now. So, so I start with an overview of what the presentation is going to cover. So the first sort of main topic is the, how the idea of user ownership fits into the Xerox mission. Okay, so we're going to try and understand why do we want to, to aim for user ownership as, as the protocol you know, expands in usage and as we continue to develop it. Uh, the second topic is going to be about you know, who, should, who should be this user owner. Uh, and why are we identifying market makers as, as candidate user owners of the Xerox protocol that might be more suitable than, than other groups such as relayers and, and retail traders? Uh, the third component will be about this new protocol fee and liquidity rebate scheme that we're going to be using in order to incentivize uh, market makers to begin to take ownership of the Xerox token. And finally, we'll go into some, some, a brief uh, overview of some economic and user experience aspects of, the, of this, this program. So how, how are we going to design this so it achieves certain economic objectives and so that the user experience on Xerox continues to be clean and efficient. Okay, so let's, as a starting point, it makes sense to launch in with the, the Xerox mission statement, which is to create a tokenized world where all value can flow freely. So that is the overarching goal of the organization. This is what we're striving for in creating the protocol and bringing it to our users. And I wanted to unpack this into sort of three constituent aspects. The first is openness, right? So, so the immediate goal is to eliminate barriers to the online exchange of financial and non-financial assets, right? This is what we want to achieve. And we want to think about interpreting that. Uh, how do we measure progress? How do we gauge you know, our success in achieving this? And, and that maps into this idea of user benefit. So we measure our progress in eliminating barriers to online exchange in terms of the liquidity we're delivering to our end users. Right? The more liquidity we're, we're allowing people to access, you know, the, the more successful we are at achieving our goal. And then the final aspect of this is how do we sort of stay true to our mission in the long term? How do we ensure you know, that we're actually focused to making choices that help to, to benefit our users to deliver this value? Um, and that involves governance, the creation of mechanisms that are going to hold the protocol accountable for being developed in the interests of these users it's trying to serve, rather than potentially some sort of outside owner who might want to, to earn a profit. Uh, and, and so we want to think about, you know, how does the ecosystem fit together? What are the members of this, this chain of value that we create when we deliver um, liquidity to our end users? And so this, this pyramid is sort of a picture of this value chain. Um, with, at the top of the pyramid, we have the Xerox protocol. And this, this Xerox protocol is a platform that's going to connect three groups, relayers, uh, market makers, and retail traders. So relayers are these exchanges or venues uh, built on top of the protocol that provide a place for market makers to, to uh, meet their retail customers, which are going to be uh, the retail traders. So the market makers are going to host an inventory of assets to buy and sell uh, on the relayer. And then the retail traders are going to arrive and purchase um, from the market makers inventory. Right? So, so in, this, in this framework, the, the relayers and market makers are downstream businesses that are operating on the Xerox protocol. Uh, but the end user, the final customer, is the retail trader, and that is the, the sort of person, the group that we're trying to deliver value to. So that gets in the sense of what do we mean when we said we want to measure our progress in terms of user benefit. We want to map that into the liquidity we're delivering to end users. Here, we kind of identify a specific type of end user um, that we're trying to serve and, and that we're trying to track you know, the value we're providing to them. Um, so Xerox creates value and it, by enhancing retail traders' access to liquidity. So they have these new opportunities to buy and sell uh, assets online. And so how can we kind of measure our progress in serving up these opportunities to our, our retail traders? Um, well, you can also you know, break this into three dimensions. The, the first is market access. You know, how widely accessible are Xerox uh, protocol marketplaces? 
Uh, is access to these marketplaces, you know, can anyone across the globe use them? Is it only limited by geography to a certain set of participants? Do you need to have a lot of money? Um, is access to the marketplaces direct? Can, can a user sort of go directly online and trade with a peer, you know, located somewhere else in the world, or do they have to go through an intermediary who they might need to pay fees to? Is access costly? You know, do you need to pay a bunch, you know, go through a long process or, or spend some money in order to be, be able to begin using um, this product, or can you just jump in for free without anyone's permission? Okay, so the next dimension is market scope, right? What, what can you do on these marketplaces? How many varieties of assets are available for trade? Is it just, you know, tokens? Are there stocks? Are there, are there stable coins? Are there game items? What is the universe of assets uh, that can be traded on our markets? Um, the more, of course, the better. And then when you're buying and selling these assets, how many ways of interacting on the marketplace are supported? How many order types are there? And is it just sort of buy and sell? Or are there more complex transactions that we can mediate? Uh, on our relayers. And then the final aspect of this is kind of market efficiency. In all of these markets, uh, what is the cost of executing a trade, right? Are we getting a fair price when we're buying and selling, or are we paying a substantial markup you know, whenever we transact so that, you know, sort of so as to discourage um, the growth in the volume of trade overall? What is, and we can measure that total cost of executing a trade as this, the bid-ask spread, you know, the difference between the price that an asset is is bought at and sold at, uh, and on top of that, any fees charged by intermediaries in the exchange process, whether that be the protocol, the relayer, or you know the Ethereum blockchain or any other entity you know that's involved. Okay, so we want to have the you know, market be as accessible as possible, have the broadest scope as possible, and have the lowest um, user costs as possible. And so we can think of that as capturing you know the goals we're, we're trying to to sort of realize as we as we develop the protocol further. Okay, so so we talked about, you know, a couple slides ago about the idea of governance as a means of aligning the organization's objectives to serving a particular group. And if we're we're seeking to serve retail traders, so if our endpoint is to, you know, maximize the benefits available to these customers, you know, one possible arrangement would have we have the the retail trader directly own the protocol and have this voice in decision making about the protocol to support the funding of the protocol's ongoing development. And that might be what you know, the existing model, the thinking by the existing model is related to. This idea of, of Xerox as a fee token um, is based upon an idea that the retail traders will, will have wallets and they will have Xerox tokens proportional to their trading activity. And that would then naturally lead to them having this voting power uh, that the token affords them so that they could influence uh, governance and decision making. Um, but we want to look at that issue a little bit critically and help explain you know, why we're revisiting it, why we're, we're changing our, our strat, we're suggesting a, a change in strategy. So consumer ownership is, is a means of aligning an organization's objectives with those of its end users. And it can work well under cer certain circumstances, particularly when, when the, the organization is offering something called a club good um, to its end users. And this club good has a particular set of properties. Firstly, uh, it should, uh, should have a fixed set of consumers uh, that are being targeted as likely customers. Um, so it should not just be that you know, th there's this indefinite scope of the people who might you know, begin to use the product. Instead, it should be that we can identify who's going to use it and we can approach them directly and ask them, do you want to fund you know, creation of this new service, this new, new, new good? Uh, and secondly, right, if we're going to approach them and ask them to fund a, you know, creation of a service, they, they, they better understand you know, what, what they might gain from that. The consumers must be able to understand the benefit they're going to receive uh, from the product before they actually see it. Right? This, so, so that would mean that it must be something they're kind of familiar with. So now examples of, of settings where this works well and include you know, utility cooperatives, which are um, sort of consumer-owned, uh, you know, service providers that sort of give electric power or water to, to rural communities all over the world. Um, and these, this, this kind of organization has helped to make access to these types of essential services more affordable um, in places where there might, you know, m might otherwise not be any provider at all, or if there was a provider, their service might be unreliable or excessively costly because of you know, them, that provider being a monopoly. Right, so in that setting, you can see, right, we go to these rural households, we knock on their door and we say, hey, we want to start an electricity plant, you know, so we don't have brownouts anymore, so power will be cheaper. And those households are likely to continue residing in that area 
you know, for an extended period. And so they realize we're going to be the beneficiaries of funding this. It's not going to be some other community or some other person. It will be our, our community, our households, you know, that, that will gain from this. And so we can immediately see, you know, why we want, might want to, to contribute money. Uh, and another example of this is sort of consumer crowdfunding. So we can see, you know, crowdfunding, there's a diversity of crowdfunding arrangements, but oftentimes um, the, the people who sort of do a, a crowdfunding pitch on Kickstarter will, will appeal to a particular specialized niche audience that's very familiar uh, with the product that they're offering up. And so, for example, as a child, I played a game called Wasteland in 1988, you know, which was a pretty awesome game. Was at, and you know, in the 2013, uh, so the, the original team behind that pitched uh, crowdfunding of a sequel, you know, with the target audience being people who'd played, you know, Wasteland as children and who were now willing to sort of uh, put up the money for, for a sequel because they know exactly what the game involves, they know exactly what they would get, and they could see, you know, why they would benefit personally. Right? And that works much better uh, than a scenario where you're pitching an entirely new game, um, which the, the, the funder, the consumer who's funding it, has no idea you know, whether he'd actually like or not before it's created. Unfortunately, you know, this kind of funding mechanism is not sort of easily generalizable to all settings. Uh, in many cases, you know, when a startup is created, it needs to finance expansion to serve a new set of consumers. It's sort of exploring new areas and serving a larger and larger number of people over time. Or it's entering a market that simply didn't exist before it created the product, right? Where, where consumers have, need to be educated uh, gradually over time about why they might be interested in participating or purchasing this good or service. And in that kind of setting, funding through a consumer-owned organization it tends to be impractical. Uh, and the, the basic problem that, that you know, we can think of is, is this issue of what are the current consumer's motivations in funding an organization, right? If it knows that the organization is going to create something specifically for, for that, the group of funders exclusively, right? It might make, make, make sense to fund. But if the organization's main goal is to fund initiatives that will allow it to, to sort of recruit new users, then the current consumers you know, are not likely to see a clear benefit you know, from participating in that funding arrangement. Uh, and this is something, that kind of situation is something that applies, I think, to most blockchain projects. That is, they, they have this, this vast potential market scope, and then most of their current development efforts are aimed at this future consumer, which they think is going to be the set of future consumers they, they imagine will be very much broader uh, than the current people in, who are engaged in using and funding uh, the, the development process. So pure consumer ownership is simply not a very good fit for most blockchain projects. Now, for example, for the electric power, the rural uh, electricity cooperative, you know, we can see that there's a tar exclusive focus group that benefits. This is very different from something like a blockchain where the group of people who are interested in, in using the, the product is expanding continuously over time. The set of uses is also expanding continuously over time as more and more uses are being imagined. Uh, another example in terms of game development, like we have these novel games like CryptoKitties, right, where no one has ever seen a game like this uh, when it's created. And it may be very difficult to identify a specific group that's going to be the users of CryptoKitties, exclusive of other groups, right? And who, so, so you wouldn't really know, who do I pitch this, uh, what, what group of consumers do I pitch this to where they'll be able to sort of know in advance that they're going to be people who play this game as opposed to anyone else. Okay, so that gets into sort of two key requirements we have for uh, user owners of the Xerox protocol. Uh, the first is related to our values, the, the, the mission of the organization. The purpose of governance is to, to hold the organization accountable for staying true to its mission in the long term. And that is achieved by giving uh, these owners a voice in decision making so that they can vote to reject proposals that are contrary to their interest and, and approve you know, uh, initiatives that benefit them. Okay, so, so in order for that to work effectively, we need to identify a group of user owners whose economic interests have this intrinsic alignment with the protocol's goal of eliminating barriers to online exchange. Right? So this is the, the first sort of property. And the second issue is about even if I'm going to benefit. So we can see, for example, that you know, customers clearly benefit from having free uh, frictionless exchange. The retail traders clearly benefit. Um, there also needs to be some forward-looking incentive to contribute funding now, even though you know, the, the realization of our mission would be something that likely you know, takes many years to, to, to be fully realized. 
And so that comes to this idea of an intrinsic in investment incentive. So the, the user owner, in order to be motivated to hold a significant quantity of the token, you know, must have some means of capturing an economic benefit from the protocol's future growth, right? So that they can see that if I own and I participate, I can have a, I can reap a personal benefit uh, for myself from that, rather than simply, you know, benefit the, you know, a broader community, benefit the total, the, the full set of potential users that might emerge in the future. So this pyramid here is going to break down these two dimensions um, for each of our th uh, three user groups. And we'll start with uh, this intrinsic values alignment, the, uh, the extent to which a group benefits from the elimination of barriers to online exchange. Right? So in this pyramid here at the bottom, um, this, the label is extent of economic interest and elimination of barriers to exchange. That is the extent to which this group benefits um, from a frictionless uh, trading environment where fees are low, uh, where entry is free, where accessibility is universal. And we can immediately you know, see that the retail trader, you know, this, this end customer benefits, would, would reap the direct benefit um, from, from not having to pay fees to intermediaries when he, conduct, when he exchanges assets. Uh, and as we move up the pyramid, we also have market makers and that they're also likely to realize the benefit because currently, you know, the market maker and retail trader are locating on a, an exchange which typically charges a significant fee from every transaction, right? So both the retail traders and the market makers who are providing liquidity are absorbing um, this cost of paying the, the platform they're locating on. And so if we create a low cost, uh, universally accessible platform for exchange, now that's likely to benefit both of those two groups. At the top of the pyramid, we have relayers, and in this area, uh, incentives in terms of elimination of barriers to, to participation in online exchange are ambiguous. Uh, currently, and in the you know, in mid, near to immediate mid, midterm future, we can think of relayers as the underdogs. They're trying to disrupt the market. They're trying to enter a market with these huge barriers to entry and disrupt it um, so as to establish successful businesses. But if we imagine if at some point they're highly successful at this goal, you know, for example, if they have much larger volumes than anyone else, um, they would no longer necessarily prefer a world where there, there is um, freedom for any business to come compete with them. They might instead want there to be some obstacles to starting a new relayer, to accessing some, the, the resources they're using, so as to cement their position as a leading business, and so as to begin charging fees um, from, the, from people who are using their platform, much like uh, we see the, the large successful exchanges do today. Right? So, so this, this is an issue where we might worry that in the long term, there's not this guarantee of value alignment between relayer owners uh, and pr pursuit of the Xerox mission of eliminating uh, barriers to online exchange. So now we're going to go to the next category, the extent of a long-term investment interest that might motivate providing funding now for um, some product or service that might, might only be fully available in the future. Uh, and here at the bottom, we can think of retail traders. Now, this is a group where I'd expect at least that most growth in the, the retail trader community would be coming from increases in numbers, right? So we have current retail traders who interact with the protocol with a certain intensity. Maybe they do it, each person does a certain volume of exchange each month. And then we also have the number of people who are, who are retail traders. And most of the growth in, re, in this segment is likely to come from increases in the number of users rather than increases in the intensity of use. Right? So, so if we think about the future, you know, I'm, I'm trading today, and I think that most of, as the protocol grows, I think mostly that's going to involve increasing the scope of people who are benefiting from using it rather than increasing the, the personal benefit that I realize from using it, in which case I'm not going to actually have this strong interest in funding or you know, supporting future growth. And then we can go up to market makers. Now, for market makers, um, there is sort of an intermediate case where if I'm, I'm a market maker and I begin trading a novel asset, now that's going to help um, the scope of the protocol's activity to grow. And there will be some period where if I'm the first mover, there's not going to, it will take some time for other businesses to try, uh, try and compete with me, to start offering you know, the same uh, service um, that I'm providing. And during that period, I'm going to be able to realize some gain um, from being the sort of sole seller on the marketplace that will allow me to be unusually profitable. Right? So for this group, um, there is this ability to capture sort of a short to midterm benefit uh, when the protocol grows that's significantly greater 
um, than that of the, what the re retail trader is able to capture. And, and particularly, like we can go back to this idea of growth via the number of users and growth via usage intensity. We'd expect you know, that as ZRX protocol grows, a significant part of that growth in market making would come from increases in the amount of, of volume that individual market makers are doing on their protocol. And then there'll also be a significant component, uh, which is from increases in the, the total number of market makers as well. So it's intermediate um, with the case from retail traders. If we go to relayers, right, this group has the strongest investment interest in the sense that they are building businesses um, whose success is really contingent upon the protocol becoming widely used. And we think, you know, that for the, and the sort of first order, you know, that if the Xerox protocol is very successful, that will involve huge increases in the amount of, of exchange that relayers are intermediating. Um, also some growth in the number of relayers, but the sort of what I think most relayers are hoping for is, is uh, explosion in the amount of trade that they're, they're able to handle and earn, earn profits from, from charging fees on. Okay, so, so we can see in this pyramid then that there's this uh, issue with both relayer ownership um, where there may not be long-term values alignment, where they may wish to sort of take the protocol in a different direction from its stated mission, um, because that's where their economic interest might lie. And there's also this issues with pure consumer ownership where there's not a willingness or value proposition associated with being a, a Xerox holder, and it's simply because you are a user of the protocol's exchange functionality. Okay, so, so what about this the market maker group? The market maker group we saw, you know, was not ideal in the sense that the benefit they realized from frictionless exchange might be a little bit smaller than that of the retail trader. It's not ideal in that their investment incentive might be a little bit weaker than that of the relayer, right? But they, they are the group that we've seen as, as most consistent um, with having these necessary properties to be an effective user owner. So what does this industry look like? Well, market making is a highly competitive industry with with many, many small firms. So for example, we can see, you know, currently the state of liquidity on Xerox, there's not very high volumes of exchange, but despite this, in trying to solicit interest from market makers that might start providing liquidity, we've received 100 applications from different small market making firms who are, are, are curious about exploring this opportunity. So this is an intensely competitive industry, and there are minimal barriers to entry. So that if someone starts offering liquidity, there's very little do, they can do to prevent some other market making firm from arriving and beginning to compete with them directly. Uh, because of this intense competition, these market maker make, making firms need to cater to the needs of retail traders in order to stay in business. If someone else does a better job of, of supplying liquidity, then you know, my firm uh, is likely to fail and have to exit the market, right? So because of this competition, there's, there's, this is going to sort of force an alignment between the interests of market makers and that of the customers that they're serving, the retail trader. Oh, and, and most importantly, you know, that alignment is manifests itself in terms of would they benefit from achieving our mission? Our mission is to create these, this fric these frictionless exchange venues where you could, anyone can access them and you can trade at very low cost. And we expect that both market makers and retail traders you know, have an interest in achieving this mission. They would both be able to you know, avoid having to pay high fees to intermediaries in order to conduct their business, which would make both groups better off. And, and as a result, if market makers have this voting interest, if they, they are owners, um, they're likely to, to pursue choices that are similar to what the, the retail traders would opt for. That, that their interest is, is sort of intrinsically has this close alignment with that of the the, the customers they're serving. Uh, the weak point, sort of the, the weakest point of market makers as user owners is in terms of uh, their intrinsic investment incentive. Because the industry is so competitive, you know, it's, it's difficult for the market maker to capture that much value from moving first, right? If they sort of go onto a Xerox exchange and make that venue you know, very active and attractive to other users, you know, that they will be able to benefit from that to some extent, but a lot of the benefit will spill over to new uh, market makers that arrive and begin to compete with them. Right? So, so, so this, this means that their investment incentive is, is sort of not as strong as we might like, and that there's a need then to have incentives or a subsidy which will augment the, the, the market maker's ability to, to capture value by contributing to the protocol's future growth, you know, by, by supplying liquidity. If he's supplying liquidity to these new markets on these new venues, Right, there's this need to, to increase the rewards he's able to obtain from this relative to what we get in sort of a purely free market arrangement. 
Uh, and this, all, this sort of weak investment incentive also means that the market maker is unlikely to accumulate a significant you know, zero X stake absent a direct monetary incentive. Like we could imagine an industry where, you know, suppose there's the market maker, there's just a few market makers. One market maker could come and buy a bunch of ZRX, and then his, his personal contribution to liquidity provision is so large that he could just begin to put, that, put his capital on the ZRX relayer, and that would immediately you know, cause uh, the protocol to be wildly successful. Right? In that environment, right, the market maker has this ability to directly capture uh, a benefit from what he's, his contribution to the protocol's growth. Uh, so, but, but the reality is, is quite different from that. The reality is more like there's many, many, many market makers and individual market maker's impact is not large enough, you know, for that to be a, a, a easily viable, you know, for that to be a viable strategy. It would cost too much to purchase the Nexus Series ZRX and the amount of growth one individual could achieve, could contribute is not large enough to sort of motivate that type of investment. Okay, so then how are we gonna sort of square this circle? How are we gonna tie these things together? to make um, market maker, to, to encourage market makers to take on this role as owners and to ensure accountability um, to this group in order to, to make sure that we stay true to our mission. Right? The, the, the first kind of overriding principle here is that governance is going to be via the ZRX token. It's going to be token voting you know, that guides uh, the protocol's long-term development decisions. Uh, and then this has sort of two constituent areas. One is like, how do we get users to actually own these tokens? How do we get them out of the hands of speculators and into people who are actually directly adding value to the protocol, you know, by being, having a, participating as, as in, in the growth of our business through their, you know, activities. So, so we, we're going to do that by creating token mechanics that incentivize and reward user ownership, that allow a user who holds the Xerox token to realize a larger benefit from, from that than someone you know, who's not a user, who's just holding it you know, based on speculation or some other motive. Uh, the second uh, prong to it is that we're going to have token voting so that once these users are holding tokens, um, they will be able to participate in votes about how we allocate funds about what types of initiatives or what types of improvements we add to the protocol um, so as to ensure that we remain accountable to, to giving them the services they want to, to sort of maximizing their benefit as opposed to some other uh, potential objective. Okay, and so I divide this into these kind of three boxes. One is accountability is, is through token voting. This token voting will afford Xerox holders um, control over the allocation of funds held in a Xerox community treasury. So we can think of this as, there's this funding pool for um, sustaining development, and that is the allocation from that funding pool will be controlled by, by token voting. The second prong is sustainability, right? So maybe we have these monies now, um, but then in order for, for the protocol to sustain itself and grow over time, there needs to be some provision for how that, that, that fund, those funds will be replenished. Uh, and also, if we're going to create a user incentive, there needs to be some sort of source of funding that's going to pay you know, for that ownership incentive. Um, so to, in order to, to make this approach sustainable, a small protocol fee will be levied on each uh, Xerox, on the taker side of each Xerox trade, and the, the revenues raised from that protocol fee will, will fund both a market maker incentive program that will encourage user ownership, and also, uh, in the long term, help to replenish the community treasury to make ongoing development of the protocol you know, sustainable in the long term. The last prong is use your ownership. How will these incentives work? Well, market makers are going to receive a payment that's proportional to their trading volume on Xerox relayers uh, and also proportional to their Xerox stake. So in order to earn this payment, the market makers will, will need to participate both as traders and simultaneously as owners. Okay, so let's, let's then go into this last segment of the presentation about the economics and user experience aspects of the system. Uh, the fee, so, so first let, we want to think about the revenue side. So how are we going to raise money to fund um, the, the incentives for user ownership among market makers and also the, the money for the, tr the treasury? Well, each, the, the taker, whenever he completes his UX transaction, is going to have to pay a protocol fee. And that fee will then go into the, either the treasury or to a, a pool of money for liquidity rebates. And then, then the, the, these fees that the, the, the takers are generating will be mapped to individual market makers so we can measure our market maker's role in helping to contribute fees um, to the, the overall pool. 
Okay, so, so as the market makers begin to get rewarded for generating these fees, they're gonna have this, this additional source of revenue. So currently when they do a transaction, they earn money from charging a spread. They, they sell assets at a higher price than they buy them at, and that difference between the buy and sell prices, the bid-ask spread, is the, the, the mechanism through which the market maker earns money. In this, under this program, uh, market makers will also earn money whenever they complete a trade because of this fee that the use that the taker pays uh, to interact with them. Like that, that fee is going to be attributed to an individual market maker, and is going to be sort of passed back to him through a liquidity rebate. And because of that, you know, market makers are incentivized to quote lower spreads because they have, uh, uh, you know, if they quoted the same amount, they would sort of strictly earn more whenever they complete a trade. Um, so be, that will create competition to, to sort of quote lower prices to account for this new source of earnings that they're going to benefit from. Okay, uh, the protocol fee is not static. It's going to vary with the, and be pegged to the gas price that the taker sets when he, he pays Ethereum miners to process his transaction. And so this on average has been about US uh, 10 cents and US dollars. But it varies substantially. We see examples of fees of you know one cent, and we see examples of fees as much as a hundred dollars being paid by takers um, in order to uh, get their transactions processed. And this reflects you know what it, what the taker is doing, like what kind of activity is engaged in. Um, some takers are retail traders, right? They have an immediate need to sort of buy an asset and would like to do so at the lowest possible price, and they maybe plan to hold on to that asset for some time. Other takers are liquidating assets. Maybe they need to pay their medical bills or they, they want to buy a house. And so they want to liquidate their, th these assets they're holding on to at you know, a fair price in order to, to, to be able to do that. So th these are kind of, this is kind of the retail trader use case. Uh, other users, however, are, are engaged in arbitrage so that they see you know, that there's a, the market maker has, has offered an asset below the, the price it's selling in some other venue. And they want to seize upon that opportunity by immediately buying that asset and reselling it, you know, flipping it over at a profit. And the market maker, on the other hand, when, when they do this, is going to take a loss. And so that this kind of arbitrage activity is distinct from the retail trade activity because it imposes losses on market makers. Market makers lo lose money whenever they interact with a taker that's conducting arbitrage. And they earn money whenever they interact with a, a retail trader. Um, so in order to improve um, the uh, sort of incentive alignment on the protocol, to, in order to encourage activities that we're trying to support and discourage ac uh, activities that are harmful to the overall eco ecosystem, um, the protocol fee will act as a Pagovian tax and arbitrage. You know, when, when someone tries to, in the, the way that Ethereum works, when someone tries to seize an arbitrage opportunity, um, they have to bid um, for rights to exercise to execute the trade and pay the Ethereum miner more more in fees than someone else is offering, and then if they do that, then the miner will prioritize their transaction over someone else's. And a consequence of that is that much much of these gains from arbitrage are going to be passed on to the Ethereum miner through bidding uh, for transaction priority. Under the system, we will require the taker to pay approximately the same amount he's paying to the miner as a protocol fee, so they will not just have to bid for priority by paying miners more. They will also have to bid um, by paying the protocol more by increasing um, the pool available for rebates. And ultimately that money is funneled back uh, to the market maker who offered the order. So this is gonna sort of offer some protection uh, to our market makers from uh, hostile arbitrage you know, by takers. Okay, and the consequence of that will be that the, the effective spread will vary across transaction types. It will be variable um, for mid to high gas price transactions. So if someone's offering a higher than average fee to prioritize a transaction, uh, the spread that that taker pays will be higher than it is currently. So there's gonna be this sort of two components to the spread. One is the price that the market maker quotes. The other is this protocol fee. And that protocol fee will be high if you're trying to jump in front of someone by offering a high gas price, meaning that the, the spread for those types of transactions is likely to go up. Conversely, uh, the market maker is going to, you know, if, if you charge, if we can recall that the, the spread that the market maker quotes will go down, and that will mean that if we offer, uh, you know, zero gas price, if we offer the, sort of the minimum gas price, then we're going to necessarily be paying, a, be paying a lower effective spread than we are currently. So that the effective spread for, for low gas price transactions will fall, which means that, you know, retail traders uh, would expect to see price improvements if they're able to execute their transactions at a low gas, a sufficiently low gas price. 
Uh, and this, this idea is kind of pictured in this, um, this histogram where on the x-axis is the amount that the taker pays to execute a trade uh, in US dollars. So it's the sort of trading fee per order fill. Uh, we can see that it varies widely with, you know, going ranging from uh, one cent to almost $100. And then on the y-axis, this is the frequency distribution, the number of trades that paid this price. Uh, and in, in this, uh, under this fee scheme, there's going to be some cutoff where people who offer a sufficiently low fee are expected to experience price improvement. Uh, people who pay a sufficiently high fee are going to be expected to pay higher, higher spreads than they do currently. And the, the red line in the diagram illustrates a boundary you know, where people will pay, be expected to pay exactly the same as, as they are right now. And this boundary is something that we can shift, right? So, so that, that we're trying to make the protocol, you know, uh, we're trying to improve uh, the, the benefits that the protocol can offer retail traders. And so we're able to sort of improve the benefits for a certain percentage of them using you know, the, the scheme. And we can increase that percentage by offering a subsidy, by, by contributing additional rebates beyond what the taker pays to reward market makers for providing liquidity. Okay, um, and so so now I'm gonna I, I'm gonna talk about some high level economic aspects of this scheme. And if you're really interested in this, if you want to sort of dig into the weeds and do a deep dive into how incentives into the scheme work, I, I refer you to a paper you know, that we've written about uh, the the sort of an economic that provides a formal economic model of how different actors respond and, and uh, are affected by introduction of these these fees and rebates. Um, but here I'm just going to provide you with a high-level overview, which gives you some, some conclusions uh, from the paper. Uh, the, the first uh, sort of key aspect of the economics is the presence of individual liquidity provision incentives. Right? So that the, the, when, some, when a maker generates, a, when he executes a trade, you know, the taker will pay a fee, and that fee is going to be mapped to an individual person who is responsible for providing the liquidity. And then that you know, individual person will be rewarded proportionally to the amount of liquidity he provides. So it's not just going to be uh, all the money will go to a pool and will be distributed evenly to everyone. Instead, it is mapped into sort of what did you contribute, and we will try and pay you proportionally to your contri individual contribution. Uh, the market makers are going to, in this program, earn rebates that scale linearly with the amount of protocol fees they generate from trading activity, which means that if... You know, you do twice as much trade, tra trading activity, if you do twice as many trades, you expect to earn twice as many rebates. It's that simple. If you do zero trades, you, earn, you expect to earn nothing, right? So the, there's this, this sort of purely linear scaling. Uh, and that's advantageous because it means that everyone can enjoy an equal benefit from the system, regardless of whether they're a small business or a very large player. <clears throat> and in addition, you know, because we're worried that, that market makers may not capture sufficient value um, from what they're contributing, we may want to add some additional subsidy in the near term on top of this to augment um, the market maker's rewards, to allow them to, to capture more value from being first movers that begin to provide liquidity in a novel market. Now, the second prong of this, the second sort of key principle is an individual ownership incentive. Market makers are going to face incentives to own or rent a quantity of Xerox stake that scales linearly with the amount of protocol fees they generate. So if you're doing, you're going to double your volume of, of trades, uh, in order to maximize your benefit, you're going to want to own or rent twice as much Xerox um, in order to support collecting rebates from those trades. And so to note that the word rent here, so this is referring to the ability of market makers to participate without actually owning Xerox if they want to. They, they can instead um, create an agreement which sources their ZRX stake from some outside party uh, rather than contribute it them, some, themselves. Right? So there's not this you know, immediate friction where we're asking all market makers to suddenly you know, spend massive amounts of money to become ZRX owners. They can simply rent the stake they're using from someone else rather than buy it. But we do want to transition to an environment where market makers are actually owning in, uh, their own ZRX in the long term. And so in order to sort of nudge us towards that transition, we have a program which I call Stake Your Money Maker, where market makers who are contributing ZRX on their own behalf, uh, rather than renting it from someone else, receive a bonus. Their, their ZRX counts for slightly more, say 5 or 10% more uh, than a unit of ZRX that's rented from a third party. 
Um, the last um, key component of this, the economics of this scheme, is stability and predictability. Uh, the economic model we're using ensures a constant percentage division and equilibrium of the, the total sum of rebates generated between market makers and stakers who are providing the ZRX. Like for example, if we get $100 in rebates, you know, then 33% of that might go to the stakers and 66% to the liquidity, provi the liquidity providers who are completing trades. And that will remain constant regardless of whether we have a bull market, a crypto winter, a crypto kitties, gas congestion. It is stabil it's, it's stable in all potential market environments, uh, which makes you know, the way that the scheme operates very predictable and consistent for our users. So the last uh, thing I want to talk about is some UX principles. We, we want to make sure this scheme is not a burden. Uh, decentralized exchange, a cryptocurrency is already complex enough. There are already enough novel issues that market makers have to wrap their heads around in order to begin participating, and we don't want to give them another headache to deal with. So the scheme is designed to be as simple and easy to enter as possible for liquidity providers. Market makers can participate fully uh, simply by passively signing a one-time set it and forget it a rebate sharing contract, which gives that, and if they, which means that if they generate a rebate, you know, some percentage of it goes to the market maker, and some percentage goes to someone who rented stake, delegated stake to that market maker. And then after signing this agreement, the market maker can go on to conduct trades for a month, a year, two years, and then as that he's conducting these trades, his rebates will accumulate, and he can cash out. He can collect these rebates at any time of his choosing. He can just mop them from the, sweep them out from the contract. Uh, whenever he wants to, right? So it's very, very easy for a liquidity provider to participate without actually having to do any extra work. <clears throat> uh, the other sort of side of participation is the Xerox holder. So we expect that in the near to medium term, only a very small percentage of Xerox will be contributed by market makers themselves. The majority of the Xerox stake, they're gonna be renting um, from a third party holder. And these holders can participate actively in the system by delegating their stake to the market maker's profit sharing contract. And the Xerox holders face incentives to divide their stake across market makers in such a way that maximizes the individual expected rebate income of every single uh, liquidity provider, right? So that the liquidity providers, you know, simply by signing this contract, uh, are going to be able to get a, a fair deal, the same deal that everyone else is getting. Because the stakers are incentivized, they're rewarded for, for um, making decisions that, that, that lead the, to, that maximize the market maker's income. So the market maker doesn't even need to worry about them. It just sort of happens automatically um, through incentives. The last principle of this is that minimal gas overhead. So we know that, the, that doing stuff on the Ethereum blockchain is a huge headache because whenever you try and do the simplest thing, you're charged for it. Uh, and thus, you know, contracts need to be extremely efficient in order to be practically workable. It's not, not sufficient to have like a great, you know, a theory of a system. You also have to reduce that theory to a very limited set of mathematical operations so that it doesn't cost much to implement. And so we've designed this in such a way that uh, the whole apparatus will require simply a single update of a single state variable whenever a trade is performed. Most of the gas cost will just be one extra variable um, that's recorded and that updates uh, the rebates attributable to an individual market maker you know, whenever he, he, can, he provides liquidity for a trade. And beyond that, you know, there's no additional expected, minimal additional expected gas cost. There is something, but that, that will account for the, that, that simple addition to the contracts will account for the majority. Okay, so um, that wraps it up. And I wanted to thank everyone for, for listening to this. And I'm really excited about this program. I'm really excited to hear everyone's feedback. You know, there's the, we're gonna be holding an AMA on Reddit. Uh, we will have a Discord chat. We will have uh, the Xerox forum where we can discuss the, you know, you can go to discuss the economics of this system. Uh, there's all these places where we can engage in dialogue. And I really love to see that happen. So if you're listening, you know, just get online. You know, give, give us some comments or suggestions for how we can make things better for everyone. We would love to hear them. Thank you.